Hello ladies and gentlemen of the internet. Welcome back. This week we are going to sculpt another maquette. I've spoken a lot about why I like doing these and perhaps I will again later in this video, but for now, let's let's just get to it. Before I sculpt anything, I have to construct the armature so that there is something to support the weight of my clay sculpture. I'll be using plumber's piping to suspend the aluminum armature wire through the head. This gives me leeway as far as how long the legs end up being, how tall the ends, the base ends up being, etc. It's a good flexible foundation. As I'm starting out here, I have no idea what this sculpture is going to end up looking like really. I have an idea for scale and, and there's one particular thing that I'm certain of, but that's about it. We'll get to some of that later on though. I have some thin square wire that I bend over itself and then twist the middle, locking the armature wire together. This twisted part ends up being my torso. I then cut the top where the wires meet and this is my arms and legs. Pretty straightforward and not my original design at all. I don't know who came up with it, but I learned it from watching a demo that Joe Duchel did many 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 years ago. The arms and legs need some help to make sure clay will grab onto them properly and not slide around on the armature. To ensure this, I wrap the armature in a thinner aluminum wire, which is round, not that it really matters. But The torso doesn't really need to be wrapped as the twist will hold, hold on to the clay well on its own. So for the torso I don't wrap anything. Then I use another piece of wire, attach it to the T fitting at the top of my plumber's piping support and attach the armature using a hose clamp and a zip tie. Now that it's all secured together, I can begin sculpting. The legs will eventually get stuck into a base of clay, which will take care of the armature swinging and swinging around and, and moving around and dancing on us so much. Once the armature of the torso is covered in clay, I start off by orienting my armature to my bony structures, which I've talked about in other videos too. This is so that the top of the rib cage lines up with where the head armature is sticking out, and so that the clay is fairly well centered on the armature. It matters a lot less in a small scale like this, but in larger scale where the weight of the clay can become quite a lot, it is very important to have equal distribution on both sides of your armature. I draw a straight line representing the rib cage and a straight line representing the pelvis, the center line of my rib cage and pelvis. I'll also draw a horizontal line 90 degrees to the center line of the pelvis to indicate the tilt of my pelvis. As the figure will be standing in, in a version, some sort of a contrapposto, meaning that all of his weight will be on one leg the pelvis will tilt and I indicate that tilt with this horizontal line. This is a pretty standard pose that pretty much instantly reads as dynamic even though it's the pose of someone just standing still. It has movement and believability built into it. And we can thank the ancient Greeks for coming up with this for us. You'll see later on how I convert this contrapposto into, into something a little bit more gruesome and, and wicked. I'll also orient the armature of the stand leg to be directly under where I believe the pit of the neck to be. Pit of the neck is at the top of the ribcage, we've talked about that in another video as well, there's a link in the top right corner. Having the stand leg ankle directly underneath the pit of the neck is another pretty simple rule you can use to create a nice contrapposto if you are working without a model from imagination, which is what I'm doing here. Later on, you'll see me connect the front and the back using these very same center lines that I establish here. And this is vital for a somewhat successful figure. If the front and the back are offset from each other, that's obviously a problem. Our figure would then exist at two places at the same point in time, which would be an issue for any living being. 
And since we're attempting to create something at least resembling a living being here, it's important to make sure the front and the back lines up well. Once the center line of the two bony masses, the pelvis and the rib cage, has been established well, and the tilt of my pelvis has been established, we begin blocking in the sculpture at a furious pace. Actually, I would always recommend not blocking things in at a furious pace, but with patience. But things are obviously sped up here, so that's why I, that's why we're blocking things in at a furious pace. In real life, it took a long time. This, I think, is a good time to mention Patreon. If you're interested in learning sculpture from me personally and get feedback on your work either on email or via video chat, my Patreon page is the place for you. You'll get in-depth feedback on techniques and how you can apply them to your own work. Anything sculpture related goes. We can talk about armatures, supplies, mold making, anything you need help with in your sculpting endeavors. You'll also get 25% off on my web store, plus accumulated credits equal to the amount you pledge that can be used for further discounts in the web store. So check it out, there's a link in the description below. As with any sculpture I make, I start with what's most important to me, and for me, that's almost always the torso and the stand leg. They will be the most instrumental in creating a well-balanced, well-gestured figure. And these two elements of the figure are the most vital in terms of creating a structurally sound figure. Which is what I always attempt, of course. I keep in mind that widths are forgiving and easily adjustable, and heights are not. So I try to build a figure that is a little bit too narrow, but has the correct heights. However, I'm not extremely precious with something like this. Good proportions is not what I'm after here. I'm not even necessarily after good structure, to be honest. The whole point of a maquette for me is to create a design template. To bring an idea to life so I can see if I like the ways... The way the arms are bending, this way or that way. If I like the way the balance like knee is aiming, in or out. If I like the way the head is looking, up or down. Essentially the big strokes that not only make up the gesture of the main body, but also the supporting elements such as head, arms and balance leg working together with the two structurally important elements. Are my legs a little too short? It's not, it's not really an issue for me, not in this maquette. Are the symmetry on either side of my center line of my rib cage not working perfectly? Again, it's not an issue. All these issues are solved later in a larger scale piece. A piece such as this is more about the visceral, visual impact. Is the anatomy not 100% accurate? Not an issue. My model will provide me with a lot of the things a maquette like this is missing. So whenever I make a larger scale model, larger scale sculpture and use my model, that's when all those things will get solved and created in a convincing fashion. Essentially, I allow other things to come into focus when working without a model. Because I gloss over so many aspects of figure sculpture that I normally wouldn't gloss over, it allows me to work very fast as well. Instead of spending months on a sculpture focusing on every aspect of creating a good figure sculpture, I get to spend a few hours. Something like this sculpture takes me maybe six hours over the course of a few days. I try to only sculpt a few hours at the time as I find my, my energy runs out real quick. Usually I'll spend the day sculpting for a few hours and editing or writing a video or making molds and casts for the rest of the hours. Especially when working from life, I find my focus is limited and I get tired quickly. Three hours of model time per day is, is more than enough for me to get tired. I do focus real hard whenever I have a model because the cost of the model comes out of my own pocket. I'm not in school anymore and if I do work on my sculpture while not looking at the model, comparing the model to the sculpture, it's a waste of money. And looking at the model and comparing model to sculpture requires a massive amount of brain power. 
and I have read, though don't quote me on this, that the brain drains calories real fast. It takes a lot of energy. And maybe, maybe that's why I'm skinny, because I think all the time. Thinking. That's my excuse for being skinny and for eating whatever I want, whenever I want. This maquette is for a sculpture of a character from Dante's Divine Comedy. From the part where Dante and Virgil are heading down into the circles of hell, which is the first part of the book, the inferno part. In Canto 20, or, or chapter 20, they enter the eighth circle, Bolgia 4, and meet the fortune tellers and soothsayers, people who have attempted to penetrate the future. And they are punished for this by having their heads turned backwards and they are walking backwards for eternity. Which is a pretty shitty way to spend eternity. But at the same time, it's a really, it's a really metal visual. I really like it. Now their bodies are distorted in all kinds of fashion. And we meet a bunch of people here. And one of my favorites is Michael Scott. Which is, it's, it's weird. This is a book from the 1300s written by an Italian. And there's a guy named Michael Scott. He's a Scottish mathematician and he's perceived to be a magician and that's why he's there. Which is, to me, completely baffling, but whatever. I'm not sculpting any spe specific character that we meet in, in the Divine Comedy. The sculpture depicts, depicts an unnamed character wandering backwards through the Eighth Circle. Something about bodily distortion is very interesting to me. And it will also force me to come up with a convincing way to turn someone's head backwards. I'll also distort the legs and feet and one arm will kind of unnaturally twist around itself. So there's a lot of stuff here where I have to make things up a little bit, which I, I think is very, very interesting. Looking at people doing creature effects and creature sculptures, for Hollywood and makeup effects, makeup sculpture for Hollywood was, was kind of how I got interested in doing sculpture in the first place. So it feels really refreshing and a lot of fun to kind of go back to some of that and try to make it as convincing as possible. Essentially trying to blend makeup effects and Hollywood sculpture with fine art in a way. Not that I really think that there's that much, much of a difference in between them, honestly, but it's fun to try and blend different worlds together essentially. I've wanted to sculpt someone from Dante's Inferno for a really, really long time. Maybe since around 2013, when I first read the book on a beach in Mallorca. So it's really exciting to finally get to it, you know, finally getting around to it. And, and we'll see, this sculpture might never turn into anything, because I, I have a very specific look that I want, I have a very specific model. A, bo a very specific body type that I'm looking for, and if I can't find a model that suits that, I'm just not going to make the sculpture. And, and where am I going to find a model anyways, who can do all the things that I want this sculpture to be doing? I mean, I'm pretty sure I won't be able to find one. I haven't met anyone who can turn their head completely backwards yet. But I think piecing to the human figure together from many separate poses and many separate views is, is a challenge that I enjoy immensely. And, and I've already undertaken this challenge a little bit in my latest project, the PT project. Here I've made, in this project, I've made all kinds of executive decisions on the gesture and the position of the body, the position of the leg, feet. But this sculpture would be a huge step forward in that direction. And I'm just not entirely sure that I'm up for it yet. There's a lot of a lot of stuff here. You can get away with a lot in a small scale maquette like this, but if this was to be, you know, three quarter or a life size sculpture, things would be a lot more difficult. It would not be as forgiving as this small scale. I hold my larger works to a different standard than these small maquettes. 
They need to be convincing in all aspects. That's how I enjoy making them, and that's what my natural inclination is. And I don't want to diverge from that for any specific reason. I don't want to copy some other style. I want to kind of do what feels natural to me. This small-scale maquette allows me to explore the idea without committing large amounts of energy towards creating a realistic image of a twisted, distorted sinner. As I mentioned, there's also a certain body type I'm after, one that's really long, lean and slender, yet muscular, and that can be really hard to come by as well. It's a body type that seems to be less prevalent these days than perhaps what it used to be a few hundred years ago when people had to work the land from a young age and didn't play Fortnite five, hour, five hours a day. Not that I'm against video games, actually. I, I love video games. And I certainly don't want to be working the land. I just wish that there was someone out there that did work the land and that they could come model for me. Okay, that's it for episode one. This sculpture will be broken down into two episodes. I'm pretty sure of it. Probably not three. Definitely two, actually. I wanted you guys to be able to see clearly what's going on. And if I speed the footage up too much, you kind of can't. This is already sped up quite a bit. So, I hope you're okay with, with two episodes. Next time we'll hopefully and certainly... No, not hopefully. Certainly be more exciting, I hope. With the backwards head being added. It certainly was exciting for me to, to figure out how to turn someone's neck around in a convincing fashion. And I think I was able to do it. If you're like me, and you can't wait for anything, you can check out the finished sculpture on my Instagram page. There's a link in the description below. I hope you enjoyed the video and if you did I encourage you to check out my Patreon page. I give feedback and critiques on people's work and we talk about whatever you need help with in your sculpting endeavors. There are several rewards, one of them being soon this maquette that you've seen me working on today. So check it out, there's a link in the description below. Thank you for watching and stay tuned for a new video next Thursday. Subscribe and hit the bell to be notified whenever a new video comes out. If you enjoyed the video, hit the like button and share with your friends and family. It helps me out a lot. Thank you for watching, stay creative, and I hope to see you in the next one.